In our culture today, we hear a lot about gender and identity and sexuality. But what does the Bible have to say about all that? Today, we'll look at the Creator's design for gender and identity and sexuality as we talk about the stewardship of identity. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 1. I'm going to be a lot of places in Scripture today. I'm not going to preach through one simple passage. We'll look at numerous passages today. Um, certainly topical. You know, I don't normally preach that way. Um, that's how these messages are going to be. So we'll look at lots of these passages of Scripture the important ones, I will try to give you the references. I'm going to refer to, to a lot of them. And I've put a lot of our scripture up on the screen today um, in case you find difficulty keeping track of where we are. Okay. Um, over the last decade, I have purchased more microwaves than I would like to have purchased. But we buy cheap microwaves. We do not have a microwave mounted in our cabinetry. Our microwave just sits on the counter. And we had a microwave when we got married that lasted for a long time. It was a good microwave, and it put in its years of service. And then at some point, it croaked. And I don't know how to fix microwaves, and they're microwaves. So I went to the store, and I bought one because I have an addiction to popcorn and Coke. So that's what I, I needed to fuel that addiction. And so I go to the store, look for a microwave, middle of the road, find something that works, bring it back, put it on the counter. year and a half goes by, and this microwave fizzes out, it does whatever it does. I'm thinking to myself, I think I just bought a microwave not long ago. But I didn't know how to fix it. And I buy cheap microwaves. You know what I did? Went to the store. Now here's where my mistake was. I, I think it was a different microwave, but it was the same brand of microwave. And I didn't think about it. I just got it, put it on my sh shit, on my counter, started using You know what happened a year and a half later? Back to the store, I think I'm buying microwaves again. Now that time, when I go back to the store, this is what I can assure you. I don't know what kind of microwave I'm going to buy, but I know what kind of microwave I'm not going to buy, right? I already know. Because that brand has spoken to me about their quality, right? It has spoken up. The, 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 the quality is a reflection of that name and vice versa, Right? I'm not using that name, right? And I don't even know if I remember right off, but I know it's not the kind I have now. And um, so I, I bought these microwaves. But we do that with brands. Like, we will go the other way, right? Like, that was something where I said, this brand is not for me and I'm not using that. But then there's other things where we, you know, like there's brands that we like. And so we buy them. For whatever reason, we're sold on that particular brand. It may be clothes, you may buy that because of the, the durability, or maybe you figured out that a, you know, a certain brand of, of pants fits you just right, right, where others don't, and so you, you buy that particular brand. You might buy food for the taste, right? Sometimes it's the name brand that tastes the best, and that off brand, an, um, a twist and shout is not an Oreo cookie, right? Like, it's not the same. It's not the same. But... If you have never had the, the, it's great value, my brother says it's, uh, you know, the Walmart brand is Equate. That's his fancy <laughs> way to say the, the Equate. But uh, it's not Equate, it's the great value of, uh, of mint chocolate chip ice cream, which they don't care anymore, is much better than Mayfield or whatever else. Right? So sometimes it's the off brand that you like better than the, you know, toilet paper. <laughs> That's a place where I'm investing my money, right? Like, and see, my parents don't. We've talked about this. You go to the bathroom at my parents' house, it's like prison. Like, it's, it's not good. It's not good. But I want to spend the money on that brand. That brand is a reflection of the product, right? Listen to me. You and I, just like those products, you and I bear the image of our creator. Every one of us. Bear the image of our creator. And what the responsibility that goes with that, the, ref, the reflection of that is really important. See, God has created us with a design, 
We are made in his likeness and in his image, and we bear his brand, his logo, so to speak, right? We bear that brand, and he has not only created us, he has created us with design and purpose. You have a purpose, you have a function. And while each one of us have different personalities, right, God has created all of us with, in his image, and there is variation and nuance and diversity within that, right? Just look around the room, right? We are created differently. We have, we, while, we have all, while we all bear his image, there are personalities and there are differences that we can see, like Scripture gives this, right? Scripture, if you just look at, the, look at it on a surface level, I know that the personality, the, all these men are writing under the inspiration of Scripture, but their personalities are different. We've seen that as we've walked through the Gospels. Isaiah is not the same as Ezekiel. Mark is not the same as John. Their personalities are different. The book of Timothy is different than the book of James, right? The, the author, it, it's, it's a different kind of tone because their personality is coming through even though all of it is under the inspiration of Scripture, Right? That 1 Corinthians 12 says that all of us are members of one body. We're all different members, right? But just like the body's made up of different members, so too is the church. We're all, we're diverse, but we are unified. One body. Same idea, right? We have all been made by his design, and that design comes with purpose. I have other appliances in my kitchen. I have a refrigerator, dishwasher, stove. Those may be some appliances you have in your kitchen, right? And each one of those appliances did not choose what their purpose or their function was. You know who decided that? The creator. Now, my dishwasher could sit there and say to you, I sit next to this stove, and these people keep pulling pizzas out of that stove, and they are hot, and they smell good, and they are greasy. I don't want to cook a pizza. I don't want the cheese stuck to the plate, cold leftovers. I want to cook a pizza. But if you put a pizza in that dishwasher, it's going to be a disastrous mess. It will not cook that pizza. You know why? It wasn't designed to cook that pizza. The purpose and the function purpose and the function of that dishwasher is not to cook pizzas. And, and in many cases, what we're finding when it comes to identity in our society is that we are going back to this idea of stewardship. Because we have a creator, and that, per that creator has created us with design and purpose, if we say, I'm hijacking the design, I'm hijacking the purpose, we are trying to be owners and not stewards. We started last week developing this idea that if God is creator, if God is the owner, if God and he has made us stewards, we do have this responsibility because everything we have has been given by him. But because of that, we are accountable to him for how we use it. He is the owner, we are the stewards. And this is the idea of stewardship. Stewardship is, is using what God has given you in the right way, in the proper way. Last week, we talked about this when it came to the idea of the stewardship of life. And remember, we're hitting some of these hot-button issues that, we, that people talk about, that I rarely preach about, but that we talk about in society all the time. And last week, we hit kind of this issue of life and abortion. Today, we want to talk about the issue of uh, the stewardship of identity. And we're going to wrap a lot of things into this. Um, a message about the stewardship of identity, but let's start um, in Genesis 1. Remember, every week I'm going to give you kind of the same outline. We're going to start with an overview of Scripture, and this overview of Scripture is going to talk about what the Bible says about this issue. When it comes to identity, what do we believe? Because of what the Bible says, what do we believe about this particular issue? And I think that under this overview of Scripture, if we want to build this identity model, we're going to look at three different pillars that may seem unconnected to you. Three different pillars that you find in Scripture. Let's start with Genesis 1 and 27. We believe that God created two genders. Look at this. Genesis 1, 27. So God created man in his own image. 
In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Now, when you look at this verse, there's a lot of repetition here, right? There's some changing around. But several years ago, this verse caught my attention. Because really, frankly, before several years ago, you didn't hear a lot of talk about gender issues and gender identity. That was not a phrase we were used to, right? But this verse caught my eye. And it caught my eye for this reason. God created us, and it, it, with emphasis, it says that twice. It says it a little differently, but it says essentially the same thing twice. But then look at that last phrase. He created all of us. We all bear his image, but there is diversity within that creation. And the distinction that he primarily makes is male and female. God could have said anything. Tall and short, he created them. Light-skinned, dark-skinned, he created them. Smart and dumb, he created them. You could, anything you could throw in there, but there is one distinction given. Male and female. God created them in his image. Male and female, he created them. This is the main difference, the main obvious distinction within the creation of God is male and female. It's that issue of sex. This idea is that there was a design there. There is a function to that design, right? Second truth I want to get you to is from 1 Corinthians 7. This is the idea that the proper place, because this distinction exists, male and female, and there is a design there for sexual intimacy between male and female, because there's this design in place, this idea of sexual intimacy, the proper place for it is within the covenant of marriage. This is the second pillar. God created two genders. The proper place for sexual intimacy is within marriage. This is from Genesis, I mean, uh, for 1 Corinthians 7, verses 2 and 3. But because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. And the husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights and likewise the wife to her husband. Without being crude, the passage says this. The proper place for marriage, I mean the proper place for sex is within marriage and you should use that. That's a tool in marriage. That, it's, it's, it's given for our good and for our benefit, right? There's a lot of reasons why. When you just look at the function and the design, we believe that God has given this gift of sex to us. What's wrapped up in that? Well, David, you're going to tell us it's for procreation, right? Yeah, it is. Genesis 1, what is it, 28, the very next verse, after he creates male and female, what does he say? Be fruitful and multiply and have dominion on the earth. Yeah, procreation. But it goes a little deeper than that. There's also this idea of this. The reason that that is, is to be such a big part of marriage is because there's this idea of an intimacy. An, it's, it's not only a physical act. There's an emotional connection that's happening there. Genesis 4 and, and verse 1 says this idea. I'm not going to quote it exactly, but it's the idea that Adam knew his wife, and she conceived, and she bore Cain. It's new. You know that? People would say, oh, he knew, they knew, uh, he knew her in the biblical sense. We use that kind of phrase, right? Because this word knew is not just it's yadas, this experiential knowledge, it's this intimate knowledge to deeply know a thing. And so, yeah, God has given us this gift within marriage for the purpose of procreation and for intimacy. But listen, if we're going to preach the whole counsel of God's word, you know why else he gave it to us? Pleasure. This is this verse from Proverbs. This is a verse you're not supposed to read loud in church. <laughs> Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth, a lovely deer, a graceful doe. Let her breast fill you at all times with delight. Be intoxicated always in her love. Go to any passage in Song of Solomon, and you're going to see this same kind of tone, right? What's happening here is, is there's this 
there's this issue at play where in Ephesians 5, what we learn is that this husband and wife relationship is a model. It is a symbol of Christ and the church. Just as Christ sacrificially loved the church and gave himself for it, a husband is to sacrificially love a wife and sacrifice himself in in his love. He's to put himself out to honor his wife. Wife, just as, the, just as the church respects and honors Christ, wives are to respect and honor husbands. It is a symbol. Within a marriage, it is a picture of Christ and the church. And what we're talking about with Christ and the church, while sexual intimacy is this physical bond, it's this emotional sexual intimacy, what we're talking about with Christ and the church is a spiritual intimacy. As we walk with him day in and day out and as we grow in him, what we're talking about here is that, that our walk with him is, is, is kind of replicated in a marriage and the unity that comes within a marriage. That's the second pillar. Third pillar is this. Marriage is a covenant relationship between a man and a woman. Here's the three. God created two genders. The distinction is sex, and, um, and that is only to be within a covenant relationship of marriage between a husband and a wife, and marriage is a covenant relationship between a man and a woman. You can try to define marriage however you want to, but the Bible defines marriage this way. Genesis 2 and 24. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. This is the old leave and cleave verse from Genesis, right? King James uses leave and cleave, and it rhymes and it works well. And this is a good concept that I walk through with couples that I'm going to marry, is the leave and cleave concept. And while we don't have time to go in that today, note that this is the definition of marriage as given in Scripture And it is not only mentioned in Genesis 2, it is reaffirmed by Christ in Matthew 19. And I want to read this passage, and as I read this passage, I want you to see that these three concepts, these three pillars that I'm building this overview of Scripture on, these are not things that I have just pulled out of my head. God created two genders. The distinction is sex, which is for the covenant of marriage. And that covenant is between a man and a woman. And those three points, I'm fixing to read a passage of Jesus speaking. And Jesus will hit all three. Look at this in Matthew 19. Matthew 19, 4 through 6. Jesus answered, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And said, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. And the two shall become one flesh. They are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. God's plan for marriage is one man, one woman together forever. These three pillars, this distinction that you find here between male and female, and that distinction is a design that is for sexual intimacy within the marriage relationship between husband and wife. This is what we believe. This is what the Bible teaches. This is what God's ideal is. This is what God's um, definition is. Now, now that we kind of have an overview of where these places are found in the Bible, we're going to talk about the opposition to that, the opposition to the Scripture, okay? Okay. In light of those truths that are clearly given in Scripture, what is the opposition to that? Now, if you were here last week and and, going to be here in the weeks following, you realize that I have loosely built a case in this first point, right? But the other passages, even the opposition, I'm going to give some verses that are going to reiterate or reaffirm those three pillars. So don't leave those things behind, right? Right? In fact, let me walk through those one at a time, and we'll, we'll look at each one of those truths and then go to the oppositional view and see what Scripture has to say in that regard. The first truth, the first pillar that we find in that overview is of identity is that God created two genders. You know what the oppositional view is? There are many. There are many genders. 
not just two, you get to choose what gender you are. And you can flip-flop. There again, gender identity was not a term, neither was gender fluidity. And this idea that you can move back and forth between one and the other, wherever you feel like that day, this idea is, is not scriptural. If you created two genders, maybe you have seen online, I want to read some of them to you. I'm not going to give you the names of the gender. I just want to give you what, you know, a while back there was this, uh, a lot of talk about this list of 72 genders, you know, online. The real list of all this stuff, right? So I'm a curious guy. So I go on an internet search, right? I want to read some of these. And you're going to chuckle. You're going to chuckle. But listen, one particular gender. This is a gender that changes depending on which friend you're with at the time. That may alter what gender you feel like. Um, I think this one is espagender. This gender is related to being a spirit or existing on a higher extra-dimensional plane. I don't feel male or female. That doesn't fit me. You know what I feel like? A ghost. <laughs> Ma'am, there's a box for male and female, but I don't see a ghost box. Where do I check here? Bog gender. A gender that feels like a bog, swamp, or marsh. This is my favorite. I don't know how you pronounce it, but this gender identifies as both man and woman, yet neither at the same time. <laughs> it's funny, but it's not. It's not. Because at the root of that list is this idea, the same idea that we got to last week with the stewardship issue. If God has created two genders, as, as, as us trying to be the owner, us usurping the power of owner, we say, no, 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 no. There's not to, there's, I'll decide what my gender is. You don't tell me. You don't tell me. I will decide what it is. And I will decide today one thing, and if I change my mind tomorrow, I'll choose that then. It's this idea of not being a steward, not being grateful for the, the gift that God has given of the, that identity, but pursuing your own thing. This is the heart of all sin. This is the dishwasher trying to cook a pizza. It's, you're often, remember last week we talked about the target? You're ending up out here. You don't start with this worldview, so you don't hit the target. You're out here. It, it, it seems like if you were just off a millimeter or two here, it wouldn't make a difference, but it does. And you end up not being male or female, but being a ghost or a cat or neither and both at the same time. It's tragic because it, it's, it's starting at the wrong place so you end up at the wrong place. This truth that, the, uh, that God has created two genders is laughed at by our culture. It does get silly and we can chuckle, but at the root of that is the problem with all of us where we choose to assert God's authority and say, you're not God, I am. What I say goes, not you. It's the very heart of it. The second scriptural truth we talked about, the second pillar that we talked about is that proper, the proper place for sexual intimacy is within the covenant relationship of marriage. The oppositional view to this is vast. It's vast. God has said marriage is to be between a man and a woman within the confines of marriage, and we say no. No, no, no. Uh, what if I really love that person? It's okay, right? Um, David, you don't understand. I'm not serious. I mean, this isn't serious, so it doesn't really matter. It's just a biological act. It really doesn't matter. Right? I'm just fulfilling this physical need or desire that I have. So I know what the Bible says, but that's really not important, right? The oppositional view says if it feels right, you do that. 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 3 Paul says, for this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. Sexual immorality is a blanket word, right? In the King James, sometimes that word is translated as fornication because um, and, um, that word in Greek is like fornia. 
It's, the, it's where we get our word fornication, right? And so this idea of sexual immorality, a lot of things fall under that. In our minds, fornication might be a term describing sex outside of marriage, right? But the, the Bible uses that term to talk about lots of areas, right? For instance, like adultery is sexual immorality, right? This idea of adultery, like even in the commandments, Exodus 20, right? Thou shalt not commit adultery. That's very plain, right? And this idea of sexual uh, immorality, it's all bound up in that. Probably the place where this gets to be a hot-button issue is, let's be frank, um, maybe I've just gotten older and I see it more, but I don't think I'm wrong about this. I think it's, um, I think it's much more common to hear people talk about, people are much more open about um, sex outside of marriage, but much more open about extramarital affairs. And that's all, I mean, that's all right, right? That's how our culture paints that. And you, you, it's just a change in our culture. It's a change in the way people address it, talk about it, what goes with it. But you know that the, the real, one of the real issues here is homosexuality. That's where it comes up in a lot of our hot-button issues, right? Because this is another area where God has said that this is not the model. This is not the design. Now, here's the oppositional view to homosexuality. People will say... Um, well, David, we might say, well, but the truth is, is that God is, says that homosexuality is a sin. And they say, well, yeah, but that says that in Leviticus, right? Right, Leviticus 18.22. I think I, I may even have that verse for the screen. Leviticus 18.22 says, you shall not lie with a man as with a woman. It's an abomination. That is in Leviticus. Here's what they say. They say, well, that's in Leviticus, but, you know, Leviticus also tells you you shouldn't eat shrimp. You eat shrimp. Leviticus also tells you that you shouldn't have uh, two, you know, clothes made of two different kinds of material. So you got anything that's a cotton polyester blend? <laughs> Leviticus also tells you you shouldn't eat a ham sandwich. You do that? So I don't get it, David. If the Bible says that homosexuality is wrong, you don't follow all these other things, so why do you follow that? Easy answer. That kind of question or that kind of response is a person that doesn't understand the Bible. I don't do all, I mean, there, you may f see inconsistency there. Yeah, I eat shrimp. Yeah, I, don't, I eat a ham sandwich or whatever. Yeah, because I'm not Jewish. And Leviticus is Old Testament Jewish law. And the New Testament tells me a different story. I'm not under the law. I'm under grace. Amen. I'm not following a list of rules. I'm not keeping a list of commands. I am trusting in Christ who has given himself for me. And so if I look at the whole story of the Bible, not only does Leviticus say this, but this is also reaffirmed in the New Testament. And I'm going to read that passage in just a minute. But I want us to hang. Have you got that Leviticus verse that you could pull up again, Mark? Here's another problem with this verse. You will see churches that walk around, and this is the reason why homosexuality is different in some cases than the idea of sexual other areas of sexual immorality when we're talking about it or debating it or whatever. You have people that will stand, churches that, some of them well-intentioned, some of them not, holding up signs that say homosexuals are an abomination. That's not what that verse says. That's not what that verse says. And one of the issues with homosexuality is this is stewardship of identity. And one of the problems when discussing homosexuality is we say in our minds, you, you love the sinner and you hate that sin. So that person I love, but this act is sinful. And the same way that you would say, okay, well, the drunk, I love the drunk, but I hate the alcoholism, right? I love this person, but I hate this whatever. The, the, the liar, I love this person, but they tell lies. This is the sin. I love them, but this sin right here, right? And what it is in our mind, homosexuality is an act, a sinful act that a person does. For the homosexual, this is who they are. So if you say homosexuality is a sin, an abomination before God, and this is who I am, then you are saying I am an abomination. That's not what that verse says. The Bible, in its intricacy, is extremely, extremely consistent. The homosexual is not an abomination before God. The homosexual 
is a person created in God's image who bears the likeness of their creator. The act, however, is sin. And all sin, including homosexuality, is an abomination toward God because it is so unlike God. This is reaffirmed in the New Testament, and I want to kind of go to that. I want us to walk through this idea um, of, of the New Testament. Before we get there, let me do this. If you want to turn to Romans 1, do that, and then I kind of want to go off on another dive here. I want to talk about this idea a little bit that the homosexual says, this is who I am. And so immediately, when you start having this discussion with homosexual friends or family members, they immediately have closed you off because you're now talking about who they are. You're now saying this is a choice, and they say, no, this is not a choice. And a real oppositional view to this is, well, David, I was born this way. I was born this way, and there's nothing that I can do about that. And um, the other day I was listening to the radio, I was listening to a podcast, and on the podcast they were talking about the idea of um, gender transitioning with children. And this idea of how the, that it's very controversial, right? Some people think that you should do that. And it, some people say, no, that's a symbol of being of, of a parent signaling to the world how woke they are. Um, some people say, well, that's how they feel. And others say, well, this is like a, kind of like a form of child abuse. And it's, it, it's a debated topic. But as they were debating that topic, one of the people who was arguing that said, but this is not the same as homosexuality because it's been proven that homosexuality, you know, that's in your DNA. That's who you are. I perked up and said, what? Like, I don't know. I ain't heard this stuff. So I go online. I start finding as many articles as I can find. All the articles I found reference the exact same study. I'm going to choose one of those articles and share a few things with you about it. Okay? This is how all of the media is with the clickbait titles, right? But prior to the study that's done here, Genetics has become a big deal now, but something similar was done in 1993, and some people reference that. This guy named Simon LeVay and, uh, led that, and I forget the institute that did it, but essentially they were doing brain scans of homosexual men versus heterosexual men, and, and uh, they claimed to have found differences in those brain scans. Now, that, those results were not duplicated by any other group of scientists, and so that kind of went by the wayside. You know what I mean? But genetics is the new thing. That's what we're, we just made a lot of advances there. And so the article that I found, this is um, by a guy named Michael Price, um, Science Magazine, October 2018. But listen to the title of the, listen to the title of this article. This is clickbaity. Giant study links DNA variants to same-sex behavior. Sounds really conclusive, right? As the story goes, this is um, uh, Andrea Ghana, Broad Institute at Cambridge, Harvard Medical School, studied DNA from hundreds of thousands of people in these large genetic surveys. Um, uh, UK Biobank, 23andMe, these people were, you send in your DNA, spit, spit in the vial and send it in to get your ancestry or whatever. That's what they're using to determine all of these things. And there were four variants that they found that they said, okay, well, we think we find similarities between these four things and homosexuals. There's some, there's some consistency here or similarities. But that's, when you read the article, that's not really the case. One of those variants, for instance, um, was also, is also used uh, in connection with male pattern baldness. And the idea is, is that, like, okay, you may have that genetic variant, but that doesn't mean you're bald. See what I'm saying? Like, it, it may show a propensity to that, Chris. You know, Chris said, I feel a little convicted here. But <laughs> this idea that it's, this idea that it's, uh, that it's connected to it, but it, it may be an indicator, but it's not, it's not conclusive in this way, right? It doesn't really show anything. There, and the article even goes on. Even after that very con um, conclusive title, uh, the article writes, Overall, the findings reinforce that, that, uh, the idea that human sexual behavior is complex and cannot be pinned on any simple constellation of DNA. The, the leader of the, of the, of the um, project said, I'm pleased to announce there is no gay gene. The point is, this person said this on this radio show. We've accepted it as a culture. Many people have. Like, oh, well, you can't argue that. That's just how people are. It's in their DNA. It's whatever else. 
That's not the truth. It's not the truth. We believe that this, if, if, a, if a homosexual says, I'm born this way, I say to them, I agree with you. Because we're all born this way. We are all conceived in iniquity. We are all born into sin. This idea to take the reins on our own and to live it out, we are all born that way. The book of Romans, and we're going to read in Romans 1 in a minute if you haven't turned there. In Romans 1, I just want to lay out what's happening in, this con- in the context of this before I ever read it, because we're going to read a lot here. But with this idea that we are sinful and we hijack that ownership position, this is what Romans 1 is going to. The book of Romans is a logical, detailed plan of salvation. In, Roman, in the beginning, in Romans 1, Paul is saying to the Romans, we are sinful, all of us. And sinfulness is apparent in us. Remember Romans 3? There are none righteous, no, not one. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Paul is making an argument that sin is rampant and apparent in all of us, Right? Romans 5, remember, he interjects this idea that God demonstrated his love for this and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Our sin keeps us from a holy God, but God has given his son as the sacrifice for our sin. The penalty of that sin, our sin and death, our shame, our condemnation is all poured out on him. Romans 6, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 7, this is what life looks like when you don't live in the power of the Spirit. Romans 8, this is what life looks like when you live in the power of the Spirit. Romans 9, you are chosen of God. Romans 10, if you believe in your mouth, I mean, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that he's been raised from the dead, those who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. You see, it's leading up to it's a plan of salvation. So what we're fixing to read in Romans 1 is Paul making this argument that all of us, homosexual, liar, all of us are guilty of this. Romans 1 and 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. His invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, they've been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. Let's stop right there. Do you see what that's saying? What can be known about, just look around this world, and there is design, so there's a designer. There is a creation, there is a creator. We don't look at a painting on the wall and believe it fell from space, right? We assume that because there is design to this and color and form that a a skillful hand has been at work in it. Go to the cosmos, go to the code in your DNA, right? It's it's all a design, right? And, And we can look around and see that he's there. And so if we deny that he's there, We are without excuse. Verse 21. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools, and they exchanged the glory of immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. We say, no creator, no God. I'm going to choose to worship Now, this is a list that we can point to and say an idol looks like, right? But we all worship something, right? And idols don't necessarily look, it all looks like creation. It's all our creation if we're not worshiping God, right? Verse 24, therefore God gave them up. You want to worship something else? Okay. So God gave them up to the lust of their hearts, to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and they worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Creator, creature. It's a big distinction. There is only one creator. Everything else is creation. Everything else. 
if we're worshiping anything else, if it's if us taking the, the reins and saying, I'll do what I want to do, I'm God, I'm vaulting myself, I'm exalting myself, then we're the creation that we are honoring over God. Verse 26. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passions for one another, committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. Since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness. Now we get a list unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They're gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but they give approval to those who practice them. David, I was born this way. Yeah, every one of us were. Every one of us were. There's a whole list there. Did you see that list? Homosexuality is not some special sin set apart to itself. It's right up there with being disobedient to your parents. Anybody in the room not guilty of that one? Right? We're all guilty of that one. Right here. It's on par. It's the same thing because it all comes from the same root. I will not submit to your authority. I will do what I want to do when I want to do it, and you can't tell me otherwise because I'm God. I'm ruling the situation. It's that same idea. We all have that propensity. And so this idea that there is this, this idea of this choice, I believe, is there. As much as people want to argue that this is not a choice that people make, I find that very hard to believe. 1 Corinthians 6 and 9 takes this umbrella of sexual immorality, adultery, homosexuality, all of it, and pulls it all together. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 9, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived. Neither sexually immoral, nor idolaters, or adulterers, or men who practice homosexuality, or thieves, or the greedy, or drunkards, or revilers, or swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Hang on a second. Hang on a second. And that's not the end of the passage. That's a list of all of those things. Just like Romans 1 is saying, in our sin, because of the fall, because we live in a fallen world, Because of our sin, we are separated from God by it. The sinful nature is within us, and this is who we naturally are. All of those things are under the same umbrella, and this separates us from God. That's not where the verse ends. Look at the next verse. And such were some of you, but you were washed, and you were sanctified, and you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. This is all of us. See, if it stops at verse 10, how is a person who who has this rebellious, sinful heart, how are any of us able to be in a right relationship with God? We're not. Apart from the shed blood of Jesus Christ, apart from trusting in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, there is no means by which we are right with him. And because of that, because of that, such were some of us. We all have these temptations. This is us. This is all of us. I find it very difficult to say that this is a choice because I believe that all of this, all sexual attraction to me, is maybe the attraction is not a choice, but acting on that attraction is. True confession time? This would be a real shock to you. I love Amy Gaither with all my heart. That's my wife, for those of you that don't know. This is not a girlfriend I have somewhere else. Another Amy. That's her maiden name. I fell in love with Amy Gaither. I didn't fall in love with Amy Brown. Say Amy Gaither. And and I love her with all my heart. But I am a fallen man. I have a sinful nature at my heart. And I can't turn off attraction to other people. It's not a switch I can just flip and it goes away. 
I was born that way. But if I act on that, nobody in the room, especially Amy Gaither, (laughs) gives me a pass if I act on that attraction. Nobody gives me a pass. Because all of it is a choice. You see, there's, what we're dealing with here is temptation. And you need to hear me very plainly. Some of us have different proclivities. Some of us are more prone to gossip, and Some of us are more prone to lying. And some of us are more prone to whatever else. You may not be bent toward homosexuality. Okay. But still. But you might. And, and the experience of same-sex attraction is not a sin. It is a temptation to sin. It is just as much outside of God's design as adultery is. But to act on it is a whole different scenario. The book of James proves this out. James 1 and 13. Did I give you this one, Mark? Okay, I don't have this. Listen very carefully, James 1 and 13. Let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. Listen. But each person is tempted... When he is lured and enticed by his own desire, then the desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. That scenario tells me that temptation is one thing that leads to sin, that leads to death. The attraction that I feel for people that are not Amy is temptation. The second look, the thoughts... This is being lured away by my own desires that eventually, if continue, if I continue down that road, where does it lead me? Sin. And then where does that lead me? See, when it is full grown. Did you hear that? Did you hear that? Did you see that? That idea of when it is full grown, it's like the idea of, of this idea when the desire, when it is conceived, when I, when I let that develop and grow and multiply, it gives birth to sin which leads to death. And if we believe that this is temptation, and temptation, we are able to withstand it in the past. We're not able to withstand it on our own. In our own power, we're not able to withstand any kind of temptation that comes this way because we are born this way. This is who we are at our core. We're not able to withstand it. But... 1 Corinthians 10 and 13 tells me that no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will also provide a way of escape that you may be able to endure it. This is the heart of all of this sexual sin. The third pillar, and I got to move. The third pillar. The scriptural truth we looked at an hour ago in the first point was marriage is a covenant relationship between a man and a woman. God created two genders. Uh, The distinction there is sex. There's only to be within marriage. And this marriage is to be between a man and a woman. And culture says, no, 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 you you can redefine it. Man and woman is too restrictive. It's too binary. I'll tell you our first problem. Our first problem is not realizing what marriage is. I'm fixing to blow your mind. Did you know that marriage is not a piece of paper from the state? It's not. Did you know that marriage is not a ceremony and dancing at a reception afterward? It's not marriage. It's not it. Marriage is not a tax break or a HIPAA clause. It's not what marriage is. Marriage is a covenant between man, woman, and God. It's a covenant made between man and woman before a holy God. It is a covenant. And... um, 
this is totally political and has nothing to do with Scripture. There's no verse to back me up here. Well, maybe. I mean, maybe I'm making a good case here. Our problem is when we think the government can tell when a person is married and when they're not. Because, truth be told, government has no business in it. This has told me what marriage is. What do they get to say about it? It's said here very clearly what it is, right? And this idea is that if it is a covenant between a man and a woman before a holy God, I guess the argument I'm making here is is that people say, you know, we use terms like same-sex marriage or same-sex unions, or we use all of these terms, you know, we use the term traditional marriage, or we use whatever else. But the point is, homosexual marriage is not wrong. Homosexuality, homosexual marriage is an impossibility. See what I'm getting at? If marriage is not a piece of paper, and it's not a ceremony, and it's not a tax break or a HIPAA clause, if marriage is a covenant between a man and a woman before God, does God honor a covenant that is not in the design in which he has created? True marriage, as the Bible defines it, homosexual marriage is not just wrong, it is an impossibility. Now, we, our thinking about that is clouded. Um, here's my tinfoil hat, because the big government has corrupted us all. But... But that's the truth according to Scripture, right? That's the truth here. This is not altogether a political argument. Because, see, some people say when they say, David, you're against gay marriage, what they say is, well, David, that doesn't affect you. It doesn't affect your lifestyle. People should be free to do what they want to do in a country that's celebrated for its liberty and its freedom. And politically, I may not argue with you. You know what Romans 1 says? Romans 1 says that because they were doing what they were doing, God, did God stop them? God gave them over to their passions. He said, you want to run with this? I'm giving you the freedom and the liberty to run with it wherever it takes you. You want to jerk the reins out of my hands and run? Take it and go and see where it gets you. Based on our talk last week, you know where. Not here, not here. That's what he said, right? But when people say to me, David, why do you have a say? This doesn't affect you. That's bull. Remember last week we talked about this? We talked about this issue that, and here's the George Mason quote again, right? We're back to the George Mason quote. Constitutional, if you weren't here last week, Constitutional Convention, founding father George Mason. The issue was slavery, not homosexual marriage. Should we be a nation that owns slaves or not? George Mason says. Because nations are not judged in the hereafter as people, so providence judges national sin by national calamity. Look to Scripture. Every time you have a civilization, a group of people, a nation that dishonors God, over and over again, that rebellion is answered by the wrath of God. That nation does not stand before the throne of judgment in the hereafter. National sin. When we as a nation have said that we approve of something that God says is a no-no, we have put ourselves in the place of being judged by him. If we, if we pass a law that gives this and we say this is right and we condone it in our attitude and we... We celebrate it. We stand to face the judgment and punishment of God. And that will affect me. And I don't want to live in that country. And as I said last week, you don't want your children to live in that country. And the homosexual who makes this argument does not want to live in that country. This is a, this is a really interesting thing because... Um, uh, uh, Jason, I was listening, you know, Joe Rogan has, several weeks ago was talking about this. and um, I do listen to Joe Rogan. You can judge me if you want to, but I will tell you that um, dirty mouth, pot smoking Joe Rogan has given me lots of sermon material, right? <laughs> and 
There was a guy on there the other day that was talking about something. I don't know who he's talking about, but he made this idea or this statement that the, at the end of civilizations, people become obsessed with gender and sexuality and the lines start to blur. And then the wheels fall off. Here's what Joe Rogan said. Joe Rogan said, that's, that's really strange. I wonder why that is. I wanted to climb through the radio. Joe, you're so close. You're so close. I can tell you why. Because national sin is judged by national calamity. Look at, look at history. When the lines begin to blur, I'm not, there's always been homosexuals. There's always been blurring of gender. But when it becomes forefront in the culture and it becomes approved of, remember the Romans 1 chapter ends after that whole list of all those things. It says, if I can get to it in my notes, though they know the, uh, God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but they give approval to those who practice them. And that's where we are. And that's where all of these cultures found themselves prior to the wheels falling off. And if you want to look at it this way, we are living right now in an American empire. And I'm not so sure, but what we, need, we don't need to perk up and take notice. The wheels may be falling off. <laughs> Tell us what you really think, Steve. <laughs> Don't, I gotta hurry up. <laughs> three, three. Overview of scripture, opposition to scripture. Finally, you have this idea of obedience to the scripture. Based on what we talked about, based on the, uh, the, the views, the conflicting views, and maybe some answers to those, what we find in scripture that would answer those um, views that kind of challenge these three um, tenets of pillars of truth. What should we do in obedience to this? I'm going to kind of start practical and then, then try to move into this idea of spiritual. One of the things I would say to you is, beware of the slide. An approval of sexual immorality has led to an approval of homosexuality, which has led to an approval of transgender blurring the lines which will lead to something else. I don't know if you remember this or not. I am not a prophet or the son of a prophet. But in 2015, in the years just prior to that, when we were debating and discussing this idea of homosexual marriage, people would say, this idea of born this way and back to the attraction, the attraction to other women, attraction to same sex, there were some people that would call in to talk radio and they would say, well, where does this go? What about an attraction? If you, if you should not stop acting on any attraction you have, what about the person that's attracted to a child? And people say it in a very heated way. That's not the same thing. California, Senate Bill 145 has made the news just recently. It is a, it is a very controversial bill because it was passed in an, is a stance on equality with same-sex uh, same attraction with teenagers, homosexual teenagers. But that bill in California allows a 24-year-old to avoid becoming a sexual offender in a relationship with a 14-year-old. This is not prophecy. This is not uh, news for tomorrow. This has already happened. It is there. Several years ago, I watched a movie with Kevin Bacon called The Woodsman. I think it was on Netflix, may still be. That movie paints pedophilia in a positive light. If not positive, sympathetic. That this man cannot control himself. He can't. This is how he was made. And who are we? Jeffrey Epstein news comes up. All the, you know what I'm saying? All these things, all these stories have come out. These Jeffrey Epstein, Pizza Gate, so all this kind of stuff's come out. 2015, 
that's not the same thing. Don't talk about We're there. We're there. Beware the slide. I don't know where it goes, but us in our sinful nature always want to wrestle the last vestige of control from God that we can. I've seen it in my own life because I've done it. The control that I try to, I try to secede from God, I try to leave that union, I try to do my own thing, and out there in my sin, it is never enough. God, stay out of this area of my life. Oh, wait, God, okay, maybe I'll take this one too. Oh, maybe I'll take this one too. Just back off, I got it. It's never enough. And the same thing is true here in your practical way, in the ways that you vote, how you watch the news, how you watch movies, everything that you consume, beware the slide in your own heart. But I would say this. I would say we should submit to the creator's authority by honoring the design that he has given us for identity and sexuality and marriage. Live with the identity that God has given you. Be faithful to your spouse. It's the same sort of thing, right? Be faithful to your spouse in every single way. Honor God in your sexuality prior to marriage. Honor God. Don't deviate from his plan or design. This is impossible because of our sinfulness and our sinful nature. All those things I've given you are not tips to be a better person. Like we talked about Wednesday night, these are not tips to be a better person. What I'm saying about here is, is that these are the things that we should do. We should submit to God. That is impossible in our own power, which leads me to this point. We should repent of the ways that we have turned away from God's design. We just turn to him. We surrender to him. We give it over to him because the truth is, is that you could say that today was about transgender, homosexuality. If you want, that's the hot button topic we talk about. But the real issue with all of those discussions is an issue of stewardship. And every one of us is guilty of saying, stay out of my business. It's my life. I'll do what I want to. And the Bible calls us, every one of us, with that attitude of heart to surrender. When his Holy Spirit draws us to him, we surrender to him. Lord, I'm no longer in control. Lord, my life is far from you, and I recognize it. There's nothing I can do about it, and I'm placing my whole life in your hands. Change me. Don't change my outside actions. Change me from inside. Change my desires. Change my, my wants. Change the desires of my heart. Give me a hunger and a thirst for you that is so strong, I don't want anything else. That the things of this world would grow strangely dim in the light of your glory and grace. Amen. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed as they come with a hymn of invitation, I want you to think today about where you are. Think about the way that God has made you. Think about how that image that we have been created in has been marred by that sin. It has produced a sin nature of all of us. Born in sin, conceived in iniquity. And then today, I don't think I have to lay out bullet points here of how the Lord might be speaking to you. I believe that the power of the Spirit is such that I can preach a message from numerous places in Scripture about, frankly, numerous topics. And the Holy Spirit used that to speak to you in any way He chooses. Even the things that I mentioned may not be specific to your life or specific temptations or specific attitudes of your heart. But maybe this idea of wrestling control away from God and living as, trying to live as the owner rather than the steward is really apparent.
Lord, I thank you that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Lord, we thank you that everything is in your control, even the next few minutes. Lord, we pray that our hearts and lives would be surrendered to you, that we would give ourselves to you, that we would live for you, live in your power, in your strength. Not as men who know what to do and find ourselves doing something else, but those who are filled with the power of the Spirit, living it out as you've commanded. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Let's stand together.